And I'm glad that, that, that people that do this and do that and need that extra piece have an education. And I'm not putting it down a bit. I've spent many years of my life in education. But when education becomes something that takes us away from who we were supposed to be in God, and, and what I mean by that is when we start worshiping our education more than the one who gave us the brain to get educated. Does that make sense? When we start worshiping the credentials behind a name instead of the name that they well, it's the name above all names. Then, then we have a problem. And, and I've dealt with people who don't know Jesus, who've never had a real experience that they recognize. Many people have had real experiences with God and they just didn't recognize him. They didn't know what was going on. We've talked about that before. Peter didn't know that it was God the Father that told him that, that God the Son, Jesus Christ, was who he said he was. He didn't realize that God had told him, so they haven't recognized him. And, and, and those folks will look at all the information and they'll come to a conclusion because the Bible says that the Word of God is foolishness to those who don't have the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is spiritually, I mean, the Word of God is spiritually discerned. And so they will just act on their education as opposed to their experience with God. I said a bunch of words there. What it means is a lot of people think they know who God is, and they don't. They, it hasn't been spiritually revealed, or they haven't acted upon it. And, and that's a problem. And you see it show up in our world when people come out and make statements. And I heard one this week by the head of our government that just scared me. That what happened with the, the, the poor pilot from uh, Jordan was burnt in a cage and I, it was just hard to think about. And, and the, the statement was made that we shouldn't get too high and mighty and not think of or remember the things that Christians have done in, in the name of Christianity in the past. I think that that's from an intellectual point of view and not from a spiritual point of view. Let me say this, just real strong. Don't judge Christianity by the history of men. Judge Christianity by Christ. Let me say that again. Don't judge Christianity by the history of men, including this one. You look in my history, you're going to see some ugly stuff. Judge Christianity by who Jesus Christ is. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We don't do things in Jesus' name saying, well, I'm representing Jesus and I'm doing it this way. We do it when we say in the name of Jesus. We're talking about the character of Jesus Christ. And so when we act in the character of Jesus Christ, that's way different than somebody coming in and blacking like they're planting a flag in the name of Jesus, I'm doing this. If we pray in the character of Jesus Christ, the Bible says it will be answered. If we just put magic words, well, in the name of Jesus, I want a new car, Chances are, how many does how many that work for y'all? <laughs> you know? Now, Billy DeVar and them, they, they look forward to people saying like that. They, they'll help you get one, one way or another. But that's, that's I'm not putting out Billy DeVar and them. It's just that they're anxious to sell the car. But, but listen, in the character of who Jesus is, does that make sense? Intellectuals will look at it on a historical <laughs> basis. Christians will look at it on an experiential basis and on from the word, what, who Jesus is. So today, to refute all those ideas, well, in the name of Christianity, the, the Crusades took place, the Inquisition took place, uh, slavery took place, and all this, you know what? I could do things in, 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 the, in the name of, uh, I don't know, Pizza Hut. <coughs> Doesn't reflect on pizza. Right? <laughs> so you, would, you shouldn't just Pizza Hut about what I do in the name of Pizza Hut. Does that make sense? So be, be very careful when you hear such things. What, what's the best argument? By the way, it's not just our, our leaders. My aunt that I spoke about last week, many times over the years, her rationalization of not believing in Jesus Christ. Look at all the trouble religion has caused all through the years that she brought up the Crusades and all that kind of stuff. She was looking at it from an intellectual point of view, not from who Jesus is. And as you, most of you know from last week, she didn't know who Jesus was until she needed peace in the last three hours of her life. And so we're not looking. I'm not saying turn off your brain. God gave you your brain. But use your brain to discern the difference between people who want to pack themselves in the back of education and those who are walking hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. With that said, we're going to fix the start to start. Remember, whatever I say, check it out in God's Word. Amen? You, you can go check it out in God's Word. And if I'm saying something wrong, I'm wrong. God's Word is correct. So, let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for, for loving me. For, Lord, giving me this opportunity to, to share, follow your word. Lord, I pray your character. Lord, I pray that, that your character, your word, Lord, just uh, makes me and, and, and any pride or any other issue that I've got invisible. And then, Father, your people just hear from you this morning. Father, including me, I need to hear from you every day. And I pray, Father, we don't get so proud in our, and Father, it doesn't have to be academic knowledge. We can get awfully proud of our opinions. Father, that we don't get so proud of our opinions that we, we, we can't see you. We're not discerning spiritually. We're just doing what makes us feel good. Father, I pray in your name, in your character, that we get closer to you today. I pray. Amen. I've said many times that when you practice religion, religion without love, there's a word for it. What's that word? It just means you're asking people to do the impossible. You're asking people to love their enemy. Right? And if you have somebody who, who has no legs and, and, and you punish them because they won't run the 100 yard dash in under 10 seconds, you're just being mean. And, and the truth is, there's no goodness, real goodness, it's the uh, lasting goodness in me without Jesus Christ. And if you ask somebody to be good without the power of God, you're just being mean. We're, we're crippled morally. We, we broke our brains in the fall from, from, from God and from, from grace in, in the garden way back then. Great, wonderfully, Jesus is reaching for us to save us from ourselves. Did you know that he loves you in spite of you? He loves me in spite of the things that I've done and in spite of the thoughts that I've had. And it wasn't just yesterday that he saved me. He's still saving me. I need it. I need a Savior every day. He will save me until I get there. And I need it every day. If you don't think I'm wrong often, my wife's sitting right up here. She can, she, she can bounce you. You know? And so I need a compass. I need a compass that shows me what's right every day. I need God's Word. I need His Spirit to know those things. We're going to be in John chapter 8. I want you to get a snapshot. A snapshot of who Jesus is. I want you to decide if you could love somebody and follow somebody like this. And listen, we're not talking about deep love. We're talking about strong love. We're talking about strength. Way too often we painted Jesus as somebody who went around and was a pacifist. He declared war on sin. And the Bible says everybody in the world has sinned. One man, one took on the sin of the whole world. That's not a weak pacifist. He's declared war. He came lowly the first time. He won't come back lowly the second time. He will come back king of king, lord of lords, and he will conquer the things that are not his. And the things that aren't his, he'll take us home. And, and that's what it's about. But it wasn't easy. Remember, Jesus came lowly. He came as a man. He came as an infant. He came as an infant, and he went through life, and he dealt with the same things that you did. And if you'll read in, in, in chapter 7 and in, in John, you'd find out that his brothers were ridiculing for being a holy roller in the beginning of chapter 7. What's got into Jesus? Now, admittedly, it had to be tough being a sibling of Jesus the Christ. You talk about the, 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 the son that never did anything wrong. How many sins did Jesus commit? Zero. So, you think there might have been a little animosity in his brothers in the household? There was a good bit of animosity, I'm sure. You know, just, yeah, it was tough. It, and so you find out that they're getting ready for the Feast of the Tabernacles or the shelters in the beginning of uh, chapter 7. And the brothers say, hey, you need to be up there. You're, you're one of the, you know, those guys that, that are closer to God than anybody. You, man, you really got into this, this worship thing. and you, You're just one of them holy roads. You, you ought to be there. That's kind of the sentiment of what they're saying. They went on ahead. She said it wasn't his time. He might be later. By the end of chapter 7, the, the structure, he, he was so threatening against the structure that had been there for thousands of years now, the Jewish structure, that they're wondering why the temple guards didn't arrest him. You can go read that part. Uh, and it, it talks about, well, y'all didn't arrest him? And the guards came back and said, man, y'all didn't hear this guy talk? He's got something that nobody else has got. And, and finally, Nicodemus, who we had read about in, in John chapter 3, has to tell him, guys, you can't convict somebody without a trial. What are you thinking? 
Of course, they jumped on Nicodemus and said, are you from Galilee too? Are you one of them guys following him? Did you know that, that people will not understand you're following Jesus Christ? They don't get it. Why? Because it's not seen. It's definitely not publicized in, in the proper way on TV. Popular culture doesn't get it. We were talking this morning about movies that, that are on. We've had some amazing movies in the last few years. Uh, the, 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 the little church out of Georgia, I think it is, that, that did... Uh, uh, some name some of those the courage and facing the giants, courageous and all those amazing people. Who knew God and who did And then we had some strange movies come out of Hollywood. They'll put names like Noah and, and, and the different ones up there, and they don't know nothing about God. And, and they, they, they take some freedoms with the text. And, uh, and so remember, if you watch one, let's go back and read the Bible, see what it really says. If you're looking for a, a show that got a Hollywood, great. And, and it is as good entertainment as I can. You know, but at the same time, check it with the Bible before you leave. But you can tell the difference between those. So don't expect Jesus to be declared to you from popular culture. It's going to pretty much have to come from someone who has the Spirit of God in them. Amen? Because remember, God's Word is spiritually discerned. And if they don't have God's Spirit in them, they're just going to make a, a, a story and they're going to embellish it how they want to. So be very careful with that. Uh, listen, I'm not condemning everyone, everyone out there who is doing these things that doesn't know Jesus yet. That's why I'm still on this earth. That's why the church is still on this earth. To what? To tell them and to give them this precious gift that's been given to us. So, you know, I really, I'm glad they're trying. I'm glad they're kind of looking in that direction then. Anyway, after all of that, we get to chapter 8. Now, Jerusalem is on this hill, the Temple Mount. Then there's a valley. And then there's another mount right here called the Mount of Olives. And uh, when we got to go, the first place they took us was the Mount of Olives. And you get to look across the, the valley at the, the Temple Mount and, and where the, the walls are around Jerusalem and all those things. It's really interesting. Jesus, the only night that we can find validated that he actually spent in Jerusalem, the only night was the night before his crucifixion. Interesting. Where the center of worship was in, in the Jewish faith, and he was born a Jew, was a place that we can't find the east. The only time that he spent the night there was when he was held prisoner. Now, of course, he spent a couple more nights there. After that, the next morning, he was gone. He was resurrected. Right? But that's the only night that we can find. So every, every time he was there, he would leave and he'd at least go to the Mount of Olives. He might even go on the cross and go down to uh, uh, Bethlehem and see his friends. So it's about a mile walk back then, which wasn't far from him. He walked every day. But that's what he would do. So it says in verse 1 and in chapter 8, it said, But Jesus, after they didn't arrest him, and they didn't know what to do with him, he left, went back to the Mount of Olives. Early the next morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him. Could it be that religion didn't answer real questions for real people? Could it be that, that religion by itself was only set up for those who were involved, who had the right robes, and, 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 and their, maybe their job depended on it, or, or, or all those kind of things, maybe their self-esteem depended on being ranked high enough in religion to... to, to be recognized. And yet the people aren't going for that. They're coming to see this Jesus guy. A street preacher who didn't have credentials from this seminary or, or that seminary or, or any of those kind of things. Didn't have that. And where are they at? Early in the morning he came into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. He didn't get up bigger than them. He didn't stand up and, and shake his finger at them. He sat down. You know, sometimes you can, you can end a lot of hostility with people when everybody's kind of getting in your face and all. And you sit down and, and kind of cross around and say, well, let's talk. Sometimes the hostility goes down. I've seen people in this room diffuse hostility just by not giving direct eye contact, even turn away and talking softly. You know, to people and diffuse a bad situation. Jesus sat down to teach. Early in the morning, he came to the temple, and all the people came and he sat down and he talked them. He didn't yell at them, he equipped them. He taught them things that they could use. 
That's different. That he, now, talk means that he wasn't uh, saying, repeat after me and then have a, a mantra of, of what was going on. He, he talked. Look, Charles, apparently we got, I got the wrong font up there. So you wouldn't mind fixing that. Uh, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman called <coughs> adultery. What's adultery? It's interesting that this morning the Sunday school lesson was on God's idea about sex. Sex is pretty powerful stuff. It can create life and it can set up death in it. It can create life in, in a newborn baby and, and, and so it's, it's extremely powerful. It can, it can help a man and a woman grow closer together in matrimony and in marriage. But outside of marriage it's so powerful so powerful that it can cause a lot of pain. It can create an unwanted life that, that will be ended in abortion. It can, it can uh, put a strain on the, 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 the two that God's put together for life. When, when sex is outside of that marriage and what can happen? They're not together anymore. And that's the one example where Christ says, you know, the church is my bride. I would never leave my bride. I will never leave you forsake is what he says to his church. And someone who tries to pull away, he's, he's a jealous guy that those things. And, and so that he talks about those things. So this person, this young woman, was, was caught in adultery. A lot of interesting things happen here that, that must be behind the scenes. Remember, they're wanting to kill him. They want to arrest him, they want to get rid of him because he's a threat to their religion. That doesn't have love. It's got legalisms. Got to do this. Got to do that. When God gives a gift as powerful as sex, it has to be what? Handled appropriately. Uh, how many hunters do we have in here? Generally speaking, we want the shell to go into the what? The barrel of the gun into the chamber. And that barrel is reinforced so that when the power <coughs> happens, all the force is going where it's supposed to and not blowing up in your face. Would you agree with that? Yes. Well, sex is so powerful that the guy says the only place it's safe is right here in this marriage commitment. Okay? And, and so, because of that, God has strong laws against sex outside of marriage. Thou shalt not. You remember those? Thou shalt not. Well, why? God don't want us to have fun. I mean, you say it like this. People, people say, but it's fun. It's all these things. And, and that's old-fashioned thinking. And that's all, all this kind of stuff. All, all those things that are out there. God says, you don't know the pain. I do. That's going to happen without this. Uh, and, and when I'm preaching this, remember, it's affected all of us. We've all done things that we should or shouldn't have done. And so it's not about condemnation. It's about learning. Remember Jesus told him, this is why God had it in the structure. Uh, Brother Bill brought out Sunday school this morning when his children would want to run across the road and he wasn't there and they did his back so he didn't do it again. He didn't want to be killed by a car. He wanted to uh, remember, do not go out across that road unless dad's there. God's that way. Don't go to a place where so much harm is going to happen until you do it holding God's hand and doing it His way. Okay? So here she is, and she's called fresh in adultery. You picture a Motel 6. Probably a Motel 4 and a half. Not, not even a Motel 6. Okay? And, and they caught her and they dragged her out with a sheet or without a sheet. We don't know. But she is totally exposed in her sin. She's totally exposed in her sin. And the wages of sin is death, it says. The Bible got it on the verse over here. But the gift of what? God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So remember, the diagnosis for all of us is sin. And the consequence is that of death. But we, we bring the antidote. We bring Jesus, the one who can bring peace to every, situ every situation except saying no to it for a lifetime. Okay? They drag her over there. 
And stumbling is what they did to someone called an adulterer. Here's the problem, y'all. There's a rat here. There's a rat here. Because generally in adultery, there's two people involved. Did you agree with that? I'm not a detective. You know, but generally in adultery, there's two people involved. And who did they bring out? The woman. Where's the man? Was he faster? Or was this a setup? Remember, they're trying to trap you. They're trying to catch you. Where's the man? So we kind of smell a rat in this whole situation. They brought her out. And when they set her in the midst, brought her out in all of her shame, scared to death. Remember, this was a patriarchal society where who got the power then? Men did. Who did they bring out? The one without the power. The woman. And that's who said before. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was called an adultery very act. And there she stands. Everybody's staring at her. How many of us would like to have our sins just broadcast in front of everybody in the whole community? People who might understand that we're all sinners and need a Savior. People that don't understand it at all. People are so scared of what they're doing. They want everybody looking at the person that got caught. They don't want them looking at them. Totally exposed. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? And then they backed up because they know that Jesus is caught. Either way he goes, he's caught. He's got it. It's kind of like one of those things. When did you stop seeing Stephen? If you give the answer of yesterday, then you were a thief the day before. Right? Or I'm not going to answer that. That means what? You're still stealing. <laughs> so it's one of those things that no matter how you answer it's going to be wrong. In this situation, if he said, well, we've got to do what the law says. Jesus didn't come to take away the law. We've got to do what the law says. She would be stoned. And, and then they would say, see, he's just as mean as we are. He has no more answers than we do. And then if it also, when, when that would happen, the Romans didn't allow the Jewish people until after Jesus to execute on their own. So they could point at Jesus and say, look, he's going against the Roman law. This is murder. We can take him and turn him over to the Roman soldiers. Now, if he says, let her go free, he says, sin is of no big consequence. We don't have to follow the law. And he would be called what? Blaspheming the law of God and not following God's word. He was trapped. And oh, they were happy in their wonderful credentials of being a Pharisee or a Sadducee or whatever it was. They loved their religion that, that kept them safe and made everybody else a victim. The young lady in front, Jesus, were going to be victimized there that day, and they were happy about it. Remember? Practice religion without love, and where do you come up? Just me. Just me. How do I know that? Brother Darrell, where are you getting that from? Well, verse 6. They said this testing him that he might, they might have something of which to confuse him. They're trying to trap him. This is a setup. Might have been one of their buddies that ignored the young girl at the motel four and a half, and, and there it is. We caught him. We got it. Right? But Jesus, I love this. There's a few places in, in the Bible that just bring a tear to my eye every time I read it. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. When anybody walked through and they see this half naked or all naked girl standing there and everybody being right there around her, what are all their eyes? <coughs> you know, that, that, that girl, a victim of sin. Right? <coughs> all their eyes are on her. And she knows, just put yourself in her mind right now. She knows that she could be dying in the next few minutes. She is in total shame. Totally exposed to what's going on. And what does Jesus do? In great love. Because here's what you say. I wonder what he wrote on the ground. It don't matter. 
He could have been playing tic-tac-toe. But when he knelt down, remember what I said about sitting down? When he knelt down and started drawing on the ground, where did all the eyes go? Where did man's curiosity take him? Right down here. Where did the eyes come off of? The center. In the middle of being tested and trapped, what is he doing? He's loving the sinner. <clears throat> he's taking care of that sinner out there before he's protecting himself. He drew all the eyes to him, didn't he? And off of her. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Could you love back somebody who would do that? How smart is Jesus? How well does he know his, his creatures, his, his created, that he knows that I can take all their eyes and bring them over here and give her some relief? Does she need relief? Let me ask you, would we need relief if our, our sins were exposed? You know, it, it's, it's all there. You know, last week we talked about the thief on the cross. While he was being killed, Jesus is saving one more soul. While he's being killed, we have to almost get to an appointment to go and do things of God. But Jesus, as he would go, even to the point of being executed, he never stopped saving people, did he? He didn't stop. And what's he doing now? That everybody's right on top of it. He's worried about them. As he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What's he doing all the time? <clears throat> He's loving. And it blew the minds of the mean religious people. It blew the minds of the mean religious people. If that's as far as the story went, I would be way more than satisfied. I can follow somebody who was that smart. And that love him. Can you? Snapshot of believers. Don't measure Christianity by what people have come up and said, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to do this. A lot of people practice Christianity without love. Jesus writes about it in, in, in Revelations. They said, you've lost your first love. You forgot what it's about. It's about what? Taking care of the ones who haven't come to you and encouraging those that have. And that's exactly what he's doing. What would Jesus do if he caught somebody in the middle of doing something horribly wrong? He'd love them. He'd love them. How do I know that? Well, he's caught me many times. Amen? And in spite of all the things that I've done wrong, he can still use me. If he can use me, who else can he use? Probably the person sitting in the chair that you're sitting on. Agreed? You know, there was a woman at a well. She had five husbands. The next guy would give her his name. She went from being someone who was outcast from the village to someone who brought the name of Jesus to the village. And she in the village, she accepted Jesus and went to heaven. She became an evangelist in just a few minutes because Jesus dealt with her love. He dealt with her in truth. He didn't hide the truth, but he loved her where she was. And out of love for him, she went and spread the news and did things to please him back with her life. You see the difference? And that's what we do as a church. We're trying to do what? When we find out we have a major sin problem, we go to Jesus. He's not there to say, ah, gotcha. I caught you again. This guy looking for tattletales. This guy looking for tattletales. I need the church to go out and tell them everybody's not doing right. No, he knows. Brother Darrell, how, how do you know that? How do you know that that's the way he deals with it? Again, I don't want to give you my opinion. My opinion messes me up. I don't need to think what it do for you. But he said back when he was talking to Nicodemus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. And who is the body of Christ now? His church. So if he didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, if he sent his church in the world to condemn the world, take names, bring them to me. I'll get them. Is that what God said? He said, no, help me get those names in the Lamb's Book of Life where they'll be part of the family forever. He said what? He didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Jesus, might be saved. Might be saved. Rescued from themselves, from the culture of the day, from what people declare as religion. Saved from all those things. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. Saved to being part of the, the family of God. Saved to being a royal priesthood. 
so others can come and find out who Jesus is. If you've seen God as, as an angry person who hates all people and can't wait for them to step on the line, you've got to reach up. You've got to reach up to, so that, that he might acknowledge you. You've got to get yourself right so that he might love you. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. I've taught world religion. I was a social study teacher for the first half of my career in education. And people say, well, now you're a Christian. said, what do you do when you got to talk about Islam and you got to talk about all these other, uh, you know, Hinduism and all these other isms that are out there? What, what do you do? So I just be on the board. Christianity just jumps out at you. Why? Because the rest of them, all the people are reaching up that they might reach their God. Bow down five times a day. Uh, going to this once a year. All these kind of things. We've got the only one of the bunch, and I hate to even put it in that same bunch because we only, the only true God where he actually reaches down, let me get lower, way down to get us wherever he finds us. Whether we're naked in the street, being stared at by everybody, he kneels down. Even here, what did he do to run on the dirt? He knelt down. How far did he have to reach to get you? How far did he have to reach to get me? He had to get his knees dirty. His knees dirty. Not with sin, but to come to where I was and do those kind of things. And so it's not a problem for me to present the truth. It's when the truth gets twisted. And suddenly, Christianity is equivocated with, with all these other. Let me tell you, it's head and shoulders above. Our God doesn't say go kill. Our God says go save. Amen? There is a big difference between go kill and go save. Now, he said, Jesus is not a pacifist. Somebody coming to kill your family. He says there's a time to save your cloak and buy a sword. There's a time to do that. If that's the situation. But you know what? Most of the times... I haven't needed, I haven't needed a weapon. I have them. Know how to use them, all those kind of things, but I haven't needed one. You know what I need? I need the sword of the Spirit. Because you know what? Those people who would be breaking in to hurt somebody if they had Jesus, they could quit. They'd stop. So I would much rather reach them ahead of time than have to meet them in a different way on another time. I would protect my family. Unless the Lord said not to. And I expect him to say not to. So I'm not saying about that. I'm talking about the warrior who goes out with a different kind of weapons. The warrior who goes out with a different kind of weapons. Jesus stopped and he wrote the ground. And all the eyes came from her and were on him. So they continued asking. They were curious. What is wrong with this guy? What, why do you act like we expect him to? How many of us have tried to make God fit into a little bitty box so that we can control him? Have we ever tried to do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, God don't care if I do this. you got God in the box. Uh, God, God only cares about such things. you got God in a box. God cares about everything you do. God cares about every prayer that you do. Somebody said once, once, uh, Thing that stuck with you said, from hang nails to hang grenades, you can pray and talk to God. He's not overwhelmed. He's not like me with too many questions. Become here. You ever had that person that asked you a question about every little thing? God's not that way. He's not irritable. Love is not irritable. God is love. He's not irritated. Amen. He wants you to come to Him. And if you're holding on to Him and you're walking with Him, where's sin? If you're walking with Him, where's sin? behind you because he's not leaving the sin he's leaving you away from it one of the reasons that we get together like this is for a little while when you're thinking about God when you're thinking about what you talked about this morning said instead of the things that draw you away from God and towards lust and all those other things be thanking God all the time and if you're thanking God all the time where's your mind where are your eyes where's your direction but when the enemy kind of pulls us away back, where, where do we go? So I'll be honest with you, I'm weak. One time a week is not enough for me to, to be with God's people. Because I'm weak. The other people are stronger. They're so strong, one time a year is fine with them. Yeah, but, but I, I, I love reaching out because it's that stepping stone to get through the week. I, I get to remember, oh yeah, I'm a winner. Because sometimes, sometimes I sure feel like a loser on Monday and Tuesday. 
that the world is beating me up and I'll but I come back and go, oh yeah, I'm on his team. It's okay. Whatever's going on, it's okay. And then come back again. And, and so two, three, four times a week, I, I, I need to be focused on God. Or I feel defeated. I forget who I am. I forget everything that he's done for me. I forget how much he loves me. I forget how real he is. I forget how I really is. One of the things I pray when I'm praying to get ready for, for Sunday. God, never let me just do this as a job. Never let me just go through the motions. Never let it come down to that. People said, you know, that I retired last month. They, they said, well, no, you don't have to go to work anymore. I said, and they said, well, you got your job as pastor. I said, I don't know. Please don't call it a job. I don't want it to be a job. I don't want to be pastor for, for the money. I don't want to follow a, a set of rules from man made and all those kind of things. I want to be the calling. And, and you know what? Then I'll never have to work again because I'll be doing what God would have me to do. Now, I wish I could tell you my mind was always thinking that way. But you know what I do? i got to go back to it pretty regularly. To keep stay focused on what you have me to do. I'm telling you about me. I'm telling you my testimony. You've got yours. But God says to keep your eyes on Him. And He'll guide you away from that stuff. So what did they do? They continued asking. And He raised Himself up. You, can you imagine now all eyes are really on Him? Because they've got Him now. They fixed to catch another one. Remember how cruel religion can be without love. And he said, well, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Let him cast the first stone. Now which one could throw them? <gasps> which one could throw them? Who of us could, could throw a stone at the center or another center? Not a single one of us. If we were honest, it's a wonder that the dishonest ones didn't start chucking rocks. Right? And, and you know, the first time I remember preaching this, I brought a rock in. And, and, and that little girl that was in, in the middle, because she's somebody's little girl. Amen? She's somebody's little girl. That rock hit the ground the first one because they dropped them and turned around and walked out. It said it to be silly, but also to make a point. That was the invention of rock music. That was music to her ears. Amen. Or we might have done that first, but somebody else did. But anyway, it's still the same thing. It was music. A classic rock song. Anyway, they didn't throw the first stone. I, I put another verse in here just to, to look at one of the things. Are men supposed to take care of their wives? Or are men supposed to think of, of, of ladies? Women? Girls? Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Remember chivalry from, uh, some of the people say it's dead, so you may have to go back in history to find it. But it was where, you know, the man would lay down his coat for the lady to walk across. Uh, you know, over a muddy mud puddle and all that kind of stuff. Opening the doors and all that. Now people, women get offended. If a man opens the door, it's really weird how it's got to be. But it says what? Christ loved the church. Look, look what this next verse says. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Wait a minute. You mean the man's responsible for his family in the sense of doing everything he can to get his wife to a place where she would be saved? And in the arms of Jesus, well, you know, the, the original role of protector and provider for a man, what would be more protective than to help her get into the arms of Jesus? What would be more providential or providing than helping her get into the safe place of Jesus taking care of her? Because I'll be honest, I, I know with kids, I had to pray often, God, I can't take care of you, you'll have to. And, and I can't be with my wife all the time, but listen, the Bible says there's no respecter of uh, uh, God between... Uh, Slave or free or male or female. So God loves the ladies just as much and he has just as much honor and all for ladies and all. But guess what, men? We've been called to what? Look what it says. That he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of the word. He's telling the husband what, what his role in the marriage. Let me tell you, the ladies that you need that aren't your wife are someone's, will be someone's, or may join the church and be one, a bride of Jesus Christ. 
How should they be treated? I had a, a friend in the seminary I was, when, I, when I was 38, and I got there with a bunch of 22-year-old college grads. And one of them had come, he was a football player for, for Mississippi, one of the colleges over there. He'd been sort of the college job, you know. And, and the, the ladies would see him, and he was young and strong and, and, and used to fun-loving, great guy. And he had a very uh, lovely girlfriend, and I had a couple of classes with her. We were talking to him different times. And one day he came to me crying. So what happened since she broke up with me? So I started saying, well, you know, it's just going to be okay. You know, you, you go through these things and then all that kind of stuff. She's a wonderful person that may not be God's choice. He said, brother, there you don't understand. I said, well, I'm older. Maybe I understand a little, you know. And he said, no, you don't understand. I said, what is it? I said, this guy who's been through all that, he's just not, he's not naive about the world thing. He says, I kissed her. And he said, she's going to be another man's wife. I've kissed another man's wife. I felt about that big. He won't honor his God that much. He won't honor her future husband and her that much. That was the part that hurt him. He's now a missionary down in South America with his new wife and two kids. He sold out to Jesus. He's all in. I have a lot of shame for my youth and my mistakes. But I'm not going to live in that because I don't live there anymore. And I've been taught by seeing God's Spirit and special people on how to love God back and how to look and do things. And I'm still learning and growing. But boy, do I want to grow up to be like that young man. When they dropped their stones, said that those who heard it were convicted by the conscience. They were convicted. Whose job is conviction? The Holy Spirit. Was the Holy Spirit there, there that day? Absolutely. Jesus said His Spirit was right there with them. They were convicted by their conscience and went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. <coughs> How's Jesus going to treat her? Now he's faced with her. Her sin is still there. What's he going to do? When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. She called him Lord. Isn't that interesting? What does it take to be saved, church? Confess that Jesus is your Lord. That's the one you're going to follow from now on. I believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Even you can go to Jesus naked with your sins right out for everybody to see and he'll forgive you. According to God's word, that's how it will happen. You mean you don't have to jump over a bunch of hoops and get this right and that right now? You know, you get the first thing right, which is what? Choosing who you're going to follow, who I'm going to follow from now. Knowing that he loves you, that he's not going to stand there and condemn you. That a lot of people won't face Jesus because they don't want to face their sin. You know, going to, to a, a doctor and, and, and scared of what he's going to find, and he says, Well, this is a list of things I find. I got a cure for every one of them. So you're not going to be near as afraid. I got a cure for every one of them. Jesus is a cure for every sin that you've got. Don't be afraid to go to him. He's the doctor, he's the great physician. If there are things that each at night that have happened in your life or you're doing now or all those kind of things, go to Jesus. He's the doctor. And he'll show you what to do. She said, no, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. And he said this. Go and do what? He said, no more. You don't have to live this way. You can come to a place of great freedom. And then you can show others how to get there. That's the role of the church. Show others how to get there, not to condemn. Show people how to get there. And Jesus spoke to him again. He said this, I am. I love it when he says I am. That means he is what? He is everything you need. He is God. I am. The great I am of the Old Testament is standing in front of him. 
I am the light of the world. Not darkness, not something that has to be hidden. The light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but in the light of life. How many of us want to walk in the light of life? Don't have to be afraid of any of that kind of junk anymore. The Bible says that when we sin, he's faithful because you can trust him. That if you confess your sin, he'll do what? To get rid of it. So I tell you, ashamed of my past, the things that happened, ashamed of who there I used to be, I don't live there anymore. Guilt will make me sit down and not tell anybody about Jesus. I go, I'm not worthy. Well, I'm not. But he's just declared that I am. So now that you're following me, you're working for me. You're doing things in my name, in my character. And yes, go tell people. Go tell people. Don't be afraid from when they bring up your past. Except that's who I was. I'm not there no more. When can that start? Right now. Right now. And I'm talking probably more to Christians than I am to the lost. As a Christian, can we be convicted that we haven't been loving Jesus enough in our lifestyle and the things that we're doing? I told you about when my, my friend, what in him is the Holy Spirit make me feel that be? Who am I? But what can Jesus do with any of us who say yes to him? What can Jesus do with any of us who say yes to him? Anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens weak me. Weak me. When people talk about Christian history, Now, if you look at me, you're going to be greatly confused about what it means to be a Christian. But when you look at Jesus Christ, it'll straighten out everything. It'll straighten out everything. Amen? Let's stand.